Dr. Richard Wittenbach Santos. It's uh, Captain United States Navy retired. And uh, during the Vietnam Operation New Life, I was the special assistant to the Commander of Naval Forces for political advice. And, and now I am the senior policy advisor for one of our locally elected senators, Senator Judy Guthers. And I give advice on everything, but mainly on the military buildup initiative to realign the military in Asia. What do you remember about the uh, operation of your life? Can you okay, share? Okay, now I can talk, right? Yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, I love to talk about it. Uh, it changed my life. Okay, so the, the first night we were told to go and talk to the governor even though we weren't supposed to. The Admiral here, Admiral Steve Morrison, and his son was Jim Morrison, a musician. Come, the, the Doors, they wrote the song, Come On Baby, Light My Fire. And uh, he was the Admiral here in charge of all the military and in charge of the Air Force and the Navy and the Army and the, the Marines. And uh, he was a, just a brilliant person. He just died a year ago in San Diego. and. He would use me as his liaison to the civilian community. So I, I was in my office maybe two hours a day at the most. And so the first night I had to find camps to put the refugees in. They were in the air. They were actually in the air. And the first group that came were the, the babies. And then and following them were the, the rich people. The, uh, the suits and the shoes and the suitcases. And then then we start getting ships and on the ships we got the pajama, pajama people, the poor people. And then throughout all that we got the military. They, they, they were coming on ships. And uh, we were organized to receive the refugees both at the, the, the uh, Navy airport in the middle of the island and that's how they came in. Then they came in by port on the ships. When, we, when they left, they left from the northern airfield at Anderson Air Force Base. So we had a rotation through. Anderson would have a thing called Tim City buildings. They're just about five, 6,000 as the processing for, for leaving. Uh, as they came in on the uh, ships and, and at the central airport, they were immediately assigned to the camps. And the camps were either these construction camps or Camp Asen, which was Asen Beach, which was an old uh, Vietnam era hospital. Or it finally ended up down on the Rudy because the people stacked up on Guam. The governors in the mainland refused to take the refugees. They didn't want all these refugees landing on them. And so the governor of Guam says, I, I welcome them. And so they, they just piled up here. We were supposed to have only 5,000 or 10,000 we ended up with 50,000. The total throughput was 132,000 over several months. But we got up to 50,000. So the Marines renovated the, the wooden buildings at Camp Asen, and they would be cleaning out the buildings as the buses came to the other end of the building. That, that's how fast it went. On a roadie point, initially we had the repair ship called Tender. Uh, 600 sailors and then the army finally came and it's an old airfield there and so they used rebar the rods of metal and jackhammers and they just went brruh, brruh, brruh for pen, tent pegs and they could put out those huge tents in only 15 minutes each and we just put a whole city there eventually it was more than uh 10 15,000 there uh and the army came in and administered that camp, but always under the control of our admiral. They had a civilian come in from the Agency for International Development, and he was supposed to be the great man in charge of all the agencies, the Immigration uh, Department, Public Health, and the civilian agencies as well as the military. But my admiral says, you don't send any messages out of Guam unless I approve it. So the admiral kept control. Uh, so the first thing was to get them bedded down. We had troubles the first couple of nights because the American cooks did not know how to do the rice. 
They did the, the Uncle Ben's loose race instead of sticky race. Thanks, you too. Uh, the animal had a press conference every day, and, and he mentioned uh, we're short on chopsticks. So we had chopsticks coming in from all over the nation. Uh, we had way too many chopsticks. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce in Guam paid a visit to that and said, please don't strip all the stores from all the food. So we diverted a rice ship, 800 tons of rice, and we diverted it. It was on the way to somewhere else, and we changed the direction and came to Guam. Uh, the, the, the first thing I said, that the cooks were just used to the American recipes, and that didn't work, the spam and, and things like that. So we had to get some technical advice right away of what the Vietnamese would want to eat. Uh, the next crisis was that we discovered that one old man was starving because he had a suitcase that he would not leave and so he would not go get food. So we did many things on that. Uh, he had gold in the suitcase and so the Admiral says think of what to do. So I said let's get all the Vietnamese Boy Scouts. We called for them and I gave them a little kerchief and their job was to take food to the old people and stand in line for them and, and do favors for them and messages and stuff, messengers. Uh, we got the banks, and I met with all the banks in Guam, and I said, we need you in the camps right now. And I said, what is your market share? Who's the biggest bank on Guam? Who's the next biggest? And they said, we won't tell you that. We don't want anybody to Secret. know. Secret. So I said, okay, I'm just gonna say the Bank of Guam gets the big tent city, the Bank of Hawaii gets the Camp Asan, the you know, and I divided up. And then I was told they could not just have a branch of the bank anywhere. They needed the law change to have a branch here and there. So I went to the, the legislature uh, and, and the speaker was Joe Adder, who is now my brother-in-law. And I said, Mr. Speaker, we need a law passed right away so we can put branches of the banks in all the pieces. That one, um, I mean, Political, a politician in Yeah, politicians, yeah. It's our local legislature, the local government. And he said, okay, we will pass the law, but you have to testify before the, the body. You have to come down and testify in the public hearing room, which was right here. And I said, no Navy officer has ever testified before the local government. We used to run the local government. And, and the, the Navy does not answer to the local government. And we don't testify and beg for something. And Joe Addison, so then you just don't get your banks. And so I'm the only Navy officer ever in the history of Guam to testify before the legislature. I had to appear and say, please, we need this. And so they modified the law to permit us to set up banks. And so we have these tents with a, uh, called a banking tent, and they'd have a counter. And we had the, the Bank of Guam here. And then we had a, a jeweler said, I have a constitutional right to make a profit. I said, I, I just got my PhD in politics and I don't remember anything in the American Constitution guaranteeing a right to make a profit. But the Admiral said, well, give him, give him three feet on the, on the bench, you know. So I gave this guy three feet on the bench and the next day they were saying he was buying the wedding rings from the Vietnamese ladies, telling them that they needed cash as they were being processed to go to the mainland. And he was using Asian string scales to weigh the gold because I had the tails. And uh, so I kicked him off. You know, nobody needed cash. All the food was free and the medicine was free and the, and the, you know, the tents were free. So I kicked him out. And then the animal said, and, and so they sucked up the, the gold. They, they, they turned the gold in for certificates of deposit and, and bank accounts. And then the animal said, oh, they're staying here longer than we previously thought. So we organized the education system. And that's where the local construction company gave 10,000 of these, what we call lap boards, eight and a half by 11 pieces of Philippine mahogany plywood. And we just put rubber in and a piece of paper and a pencil and we organized classes. It was summertime. And our fear through this whole time was that we might have a typhoon with everybody in tents. It's a constant fear. 
And so I went on TV and asked for teachers to volunteer. So they all came and volunteered. And we had a, a, a curriculum committee. The first priority was what's happening to you? What is the process? The second priority was health and sanitation. The Vietnamese were not used to the porta potties. They were not used to sitting on the toilet. So we had to teach them to sit on the toilet. Uh, we caught some ladies selling themselves in the porta potties for sex, and so we had to stop that. And so uh, on sanitation, and then you know, some people, they didn't know what to do with the toothbrush. They were just farmers, you know, and they, they got swept out. Uh, and then uh, the next priority was uh, a little bit of geography about America. Where is it cold? Of course, they, many people didn't know what cold was. Uh, where is it hot? Where is the cities? And then we had a, a, a priority on <coughs> on a little bit of English. And so we sucked up their time having all these classes. They just went, they used us to take notes and sat in the dirt and the teachers volunteered. And then we had some lady teachers say, how about sewing machines? So we got on TV and asked for anybody with a sewing machine that wanted to donate. And so we had about four tenths of sewing machines. We called it Klinger Sewing Machine Center. Clinger from the MASH movie in Korea. And so the ladies then could go there and repair their clothes. The admiral made a decision in the very beginning that we would take the uniforms off of everybody and we would no longer have any organization for the Vietnam, Vietnam uh, Army or Navy or anything. So as soon as we got them into the camps, we made them throw away their uniforms and wear civilian clothes. So we would not have a competing military structure in the camp. We organized the Vietnamese leaders for the different, one, each tent had, one had another leader, you know, and we had a system there that we could use for communications with the Vietnamese. We had a major problem with finding people. You know, one member of the family would come and say, you know, what about my, and so we had a very early computer, so we had a computer list of names and uh, on the papers I provided to you, you see some of the old lists of names and, and we had major confusion over the names being Nguyen Tri Hung and Hung Tri Nguyen, you know, which comes first and which comes last. And so, <coughs> but it still worked because um, my, my former wife on her birthday found out that this Vietnamese family in a roadie camp. The husband was up in Anderson about to fly, oh no, the other way around. The family was about to fly to California from the Air Force Base and the pilot just flew in. And so she was racing up to Marine Corps Drive, the main road of Long, to reunite this pilot. And he's still in his flight suit, sound asleep, wiped out tired. And she's racing up the highway to get him with his family before they got on the plane, got separated, and the police stopped her. And they looked at her, oh, today's your birthday, yes. Who's that? It's a Vietnamese refugee, I'm trying to get him. Still gave her a ticket. <laughs> because we had Republican license plate number. If you had a low number plate on your car, it meant you were connected with the old governor, which was Republican, and our number was 529. So the cops were out to look for the Republicans. So she got a ticket. So, so we had a problem of reuniting families. And then the next problem that came along was, oh, we even organized water activities because at the, one, the camp at Bloody Point had the beach there, Cat Cat Beach. And so we got lifeguards and everything. So the next problem was that some Vietnamese says, oops, I changed my mind. It might be like the uh, enlisted man on an airplane and the pilot flies out. But the enlisted man, he got dragged along and he said, no, I want to go home to my family it's back in Vietnam. So we call them repatriates. And so we gathered them all in one place, which was right behind Shaky's Pizza Parlor. And at all the people in first, or Oh, eventually they went to Asen, second. Yeah. Yes. After we cleaned out Asen with everybody else, then we put the repatriates there. And then one man on the staff had the idea of fixing up a ship and send the ship back because the UN was trying to get in touch with the new government and they wouldn't 
they wouldn't talk to the United Nations, so we couldn't organize a, a, a return of these people. So we finally fixed up a ship and led it to where they could see the coast and, and said, go that way. And that's the last we heard of them. We heard later that they were put into re-education camps. So, and, and they came to me one day and they said, we have to set a little history before we go back to Vietnam that we didn't cooperate with you. So what can we do? I said, well, how about a, a demonstration? So I organized a demonstration in the parking lot of the Shakey's Pizza Parlor, where they all walked out of the camp and sat down and protested with signs. Later, and that was from your idea. It would work yeah, yeah. them. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> now so, I found a man. Yeah. And then later, when they were down in Einstein, they burned down the building. You know, to really, you know, that was after I was transferred. But they, they, they really tried to let the world know they were not happy being here. They wanted to go home. But it didn't do any work. So, now personally, in the middle of one night, I get a phone call from a friend of mine who was an admiral who later became the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral William Crow, C R O W E, William Crow Jr. And he had been in Vietnam as a captain, Navy captain, and he had, he told me on the phone, he was my patron, my, my mentor, and he said, I had two counterparts, and I want you to find them two Vietnamese Navy captains. I want you to find them <laughs> so I can sponsor them. Which is not easy to say when you have more than 50,000, yeah. So we found them. And, and, uh, and so one was a captain and a wife and about seven children. So Admiral Crowell said, I'll take them, you know. And so we arranged for them to get on the plane and go to Washington where he was. And they lived with him for about a year and then, well, the other one was a Navy captain, a bodyguard, driver bodyguard, and two little girls, one five years old who was pure Vietnamese and one six years old who was half American, half Vietnamese. His wife had had an affair or something and had a baby and then he divorced his wife. And she was the, the estate in Vietnam, but he had the two girls living with him in the field for the last six months. So. I said, okay, I'll sponsor you. And so I called my sister who was in Pennsylvania. And I said, I'm putting these people on the plane and would you please keep them for the summer because I was being transferred at the end of the summer to Washington, D.C. And when I get there, then they come live with me. And she said, it's three o'clock in the morning. I don't know what you're asking, but whatever you want, I'll do it. That's my sister. So they, they, they landed in Indian Town Cap. My sister lived only one hour away in Harrisburg. She went to get the family and the Red Cross says, oh no, uh, if a sponsor is Wittenbach on Guam, we have to fly them back to Guam. <laughs> so my sister said, okay, I'll be the sponsor. So she signed for him. They ended up living with her for the rest of the life. The, 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 the family, the brother of the bodyguard came out with his family, so he left at the end of the summer. Bo. And at the end of the summer when I arrived, we had a family thing and they said, well, the two girls were so shell-shocked. You know, when there was a hunter in the field in Pennsylvania that the girls dove for the floor of the, of the car when the guns went off. And so they were shocked, you know, and they've had psychological problems since then. And so we decided that they would stay with my sister who had two boys. And one was, there went tree tongue and there was went tree hung. Hung and hung, I'm sorry, hung and hung. H U O N G and H O N G. Hung and hung, very close. Hung and hung. Now they, they, they stayed with my sister. The father came with me to Washington. He lived with me for one year and he got a job as a uh, working for IBM to main, maintain the, the, the machines. He got out after fighting since 1954. He got out with only fifteen hundred dollars worth of gold for his whole life, and he had used that to buy a car. And it was the toughest decision he ever made, you know. But he did it. And then one day, I was passing on the way to work, and he was in the ditch, and the police were there in a tow truck. I said, "He's got to learn. He's got to learn to handle the American system." 
so I just drove past. <laughs> but he ended up marrying this Vietnamese lady who had been the dinosaur of Saigon and married to a Vietnamese judge on the Supreme Court. And she had escaped and she had two boys. And so they met in the Washington DC grouping and they got married. She had not seen her husband for 10 years. Okay. So about two years later, the first husband knocked on the door. He had gotten out of re-education camp ended up in France, got to Washington and knocked on the door and says, I'm still alive, I'm still your husband. Mm -hmm. And so my refugee, you know, but the wife stayed with my guy. So she stayed with my guy and he just died a year ago. Uh, in the papers I give you, you have his funeral there. The two girls were in a very Vietnamese uh, clothes. Custom. And custom, yeah. And, uh, but the one girl, Hung, has changed her name to Z for Zim, and the the half American, half Vietnamese girl, she's changed her name from Hung to Savannah. Yes. And uh, the family's gotten used to changing that. So that was our little story, you know. But but uh, and then the admiral later became the head of the whole military. You know? Admiral Crown changed his life. He had. Uh, been with his counterpart when they crashed a helicopter in a river once and almost drowned. So, uh, so that's my story with the refugees. It was just a uh, taking care of special interests. Oh, the, the one the one night I was having dinner and a sailor came and he had a note on a napkin. You know, and it was a napkin just like this one. And on the note it was, please release the four Carmelite nuns from Camp Asin to the convent in Malolo, over on the east side. And it was signed Ricardo J. Berdaglio, the governor. And I told the sailor, go away, because everybody's always trying to get people out of the camp. I said, go away, that's not his signature, it's a forgery. And so the next day I could called by the governor. He was very mad. He says, why didn't you recognize, you know, and take care of these nuns. They're not used to taking showers in front of other women. And, and, and I said, sir, I, there's a forgery. I can read your name. Your name is normally his signature because I worked so closely with him. I knew his signature was what we called a spaceship. You know, that was his signature. And, and he said, well, I didn't know you were gonna read it. Yeah. And, and I said, he said, well, I, I, I signed my name the way I learned in grammar school because I didn't know that you were going to read it. And I wanted the strangers to read it. And I said, well, we faked each other out. So I immediately got the nuns out and, and they're still there, I think. Yeah, she, oh, left. she left. And then there were four of them, though. Yeah, I know just one. Just one? Okay. And uh, another day, it was our big celebration here in Guam, uh, July 21, Liberation Day, when the Americans came back in 1944. And the Admiral says, I'm going to do something unusual. He says, we're going to open the gate at Assen. And we opened the gate and we told 6,000 Vietnamese, go out the gate, turn left, go down the road and you'll find a huge parade with lots of beer and barbecue. And they all went down to watch the parade and that sunset, they were all back home. Not one disappeared. It was un unbelievable. Another day, they had Nina Papagayo, who was a Philippine lady that had a restaurant in, in Subic and a restaurant at home. She said, can I have at least a, 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 a stand? Uh, you know, a, a little, we got roach coach, but it's where you sell food from the stand. And, and so the adults said, let her be on an ascent. And so we found out that she was selling apples for 50 cents an apple to the refugees. And the little milk carton, 50 cents, this was 1975. So I kicked her out without even calling the animal. Kicked her out. And then we had the Chamber of Commerce come back in just three weeks after they come to us and said, don't strip all the food off the shelves. They came in and says, we're not making enough money off of all this. Give some of your contracts to us. 
you know. So then another time, I got a telephone call at three o'clock in the afternoon, and, and it was the head of the Navy Public Works, and he said. We're using all the, the government of Guam school buses to move the, you know. And the director of the public works on the government of Guam, the civilian director, is refusing to sign the contract. And he says they're going to stop running the buses in two hours from now. And we had thousands of refugees going all sorts of ways. And so I called the civilian director. I said, what's going on? He said, the Navy wants me to sign the contract that if a bus driver causes the accident, that the government of Guam will be responsible. That's a stand and I called the Navy and they said that's a standard contract. And I called the civilian and he said, well, the bus driver, we didn't ask for this job. And the Navy asked us to do this. The bus drivers are working 20, 12, 13, 14 hours a day. So if they fall asleep and drive in the ditch, the Navy should pay for it. This is not a standard contract. So I told the Navy, like I said, hey, you know, the guy's right, sign, sign, sign it the way they want it, you know. And, and he later, two years later, ended up working for the Admiral as the, as the Admiral civil engineer. <laughs> Pete Tobes, unbelievable. So, but he, he knew what was right, you know, and, and we never did have an accident. Um, but then, do you already know about the wedding? Yes. Okay. Please. I, you know, when you mentioned about the gold, yeah. is that the Deke company? Yeah, they were out loud. Yeah. They were Deke and, and uh, Pierre. Deke and Pierre, D E A K and Pierre. And they were they were gold, you know, and, and they told they told us they were the only ones authorized to buy the gold tails. So we said no, we checked. So we let any of the banks buy the, the gold. But Deke was in there too. They had a about ten feet at the banking tent and they bought gold. And, uh, that was a very honorable company. I think it's out of business now. you remember how many kilo or how many of gold did you sell? It was a lot, but it was definitely phase. The first phase were the ones with the tails. Okay. And then you got the people just right off the farm. You know, Poor. Poor people, black pajamas. So, the... Uh, I'm almost finished. They're recording me, honey. Oh. Okay. It's my wife. So, yeah, she, her sister is married to Governor Ada. I didn't know it at the time, you know. But anyway, on the wedding, we had a young American man arrive on a civilian airplane. And he found his Vietnamese girlfriend at Camp Aston with her brother and a, and a son, about eight years old. So I tried to take her out of the camp. Can't do that. We have a process. And the whole fear of that whole summer was that some people would be turned down by the immigration people. You know, they were trying to find out who was the spies and, and you know, we take it. it. It ended up with everybody going. But the, the immigration people wanted to make a big deal out of it, you know, so they had to screen everybody and it was ridiculous. So so you just can't walk out of the camp. Then he found out that the governor can marry people. So they got the idea to have a marriage ceremony down in Camp Aston. So, yeah, so um, who's the former beauty queen? Um, Paris, Belta Paris. Belta Paris donated her wedding dress. And Madeline was gonna be the major of honor, the, the, the governor's wife. First lady. First lady, and I was there at that ceremony. And we had a big ceremony with AP and UPI and everything like that. And they walked right out of the camp and got on the Pan Am because he was married to an American citizen. And they went to the mainland and they got off the plane and she said, thank you for getting me off of Guam into America. This is not my brother. This is my husband. <laughs> and so I'm not married to you, Mr. American. I'm married to the Vietnamese husband. He's not my brother. <laughs> what happened to the American? It's the end of the story. I don't know. It's worse than the newspapers did. Yeah. yeah. I mean, after all the national publicity, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the main thing we were proud about was that 
Guam always said yes. Even the businessmen kept, and all the construction companies and everything. Uh, the volunteers were unbelievable. The, the teachers, the, the, the Catholic Church, the social services. That one social lady mentioned that she just took a baby right out of the camp, you know, because she wanted to adopt the baby and it was so complicated and, and all that stuff, and the immigration people, so she just took the kid home. Her, her name's here. So. But, uh, the, uh, but everybody wanted to help. I got one phone call during that time where a very rich family here wanted me to find a maid for them. And I said, forget it, you know, forget it. Uh, you can pay for them to come back. Because the big worry on Guam was they're all going to stay here. <laughs> they're all going to stay here. I heard that more refugee than the... Yeah, than the local people. people. There's only 85,000 civilians on Guam, well, including the military. The military is probably about 10,000. So you had 75,000 local people and 130,000 refugees. Yeah, I mean, unbelievable. And so the people just rose to the occasion and every Vietnamese went on and then they brought, came back. You know, today we're just, it, it's just, uh, you know, if I didn't have Vietnamese restaurants, I wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's, it's added so much to life. You know, we have all these ho mai. We got five ho mai restaurants, you know, a Vietnamese Chinese restaurant. Uh, because I had the, my, my family, you know, I, I came up on, you put your finger in the, the water to see how much water to put for the rice, you know, <laughs> and how to cook the rice and, and uh, the ramen and stuff. And my Vietnamese mammy just lived on noodles and rice, you know. But uh, the, uh, the people, like the Admiral staff, and I got in trouble for saying this, but the, the Admiral staff were not the brightest and the best. When I was sent here, no one had been promoted in anybody's memory. They were good people, but you don't want to be assigned this far away from Washington. The careers are made close to the flagpole. And so if you're stationed on Guam, it's the edge of the empire. Guam. Yeah, for a Navy career. And I was sent there because we had a political problem about where to put a ammunition pier. And, 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 and I was told by my admiral, he said, don't worry, I'll get you back off of the island before your career is harmed. And he did that. I went from Guam to the White House. But, but everybody on the admiral staff, we're talking maybe 25, 30 officers, they rose to the occasion. Every one of them did magnificent, you know, just magnificent. I mean, one day uh, a message was sent to the Admiral saying, by close of business, we need to know this or that. He sent a message back and says, on Guam, there is no close of business. Just tell me exactly what hour do you want the response? We had no close of business. We had Mike Dodge, you know, it's a friend of ours. The, the first day or two, he was down there in his little car, which was an old Jeep, parked underneath the telephone pole, and he had the wire coming down into his car, hooked up with his, his radio walkie-talkie, communicating everything for the base until they could get it organized. I, I said, it was just the CBs. They just took these bulldozers and just cleared the jungle, you know, and Right behind them were coming the, the men from the, the tender, the repair ship, boom, 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 you know, putting up a huge tent in 15, 20 minutes. Unbelievable. They just worked till they dropped. And then my little kids were, were uh, oh, like five and seven years old. So they would always be up along the fence every day. We lived just a block from the fence and they'd be trading toys for the Vietnamese money because Vietnamese money was worthless. And so my kids were giving away all their toys, you know, in exchange for paper Vietnamese money. So, so you remember uh, what the refugees look like and the, how their condition? They, the they, they were exhausted. Like my, my refugee, you know, he was in the field for six months. His two little girls were with him and his bodyguard. He gets on a little landing boat 
off the coast, picked up by a Navy big landing ship, brought to Guam, and that takes like a week or 10 days or something. On the ship, they took away his cigarette lighter, which he had kept since 1954, his souvenir lighter. They took away the lighter and he never got it back. He's lost the war he's been fighting since 1954. He's from Hanoi and he had moved down in 1954. And so he's got that, that emotional devastation. His favorite little article's taken away. He doesn't know what's gonna happen to the two girls. You know, they're, he's in shock. He used to sit down in my, my basement in my house in Washington and just smoke constantly and just stare at the wall. Uh, that's why I let him handle the police when he drove in the ditch. You know, he's got to learn to speak up. My uh, my own emotions, you know, I, I was three times to off the coast of Vietnam and I lost the war. And then I had this happen, you know. We lost the war and, and Saigon was being overrun and uh, it was an emotional time for the American military and all of a sudden we didn't have time to dream about it we had to turn to for the refugees so, so you could um, many times ship to Vietnam and uh, fought over there yes I was on a destroyer which is a 300 Boy men about 400 feet long ship with guns and missiles and i went off the coast of vietnam in 1966 for six months we'd be off vietnam for 30 days and then to subic philippines for one week and 30 days off vietnam and we we'd be up the rivers and we'd be firing the five inch guns which go nine miles uh firing the guns for the vietnamese army and the, and the american army and the australian army and the korean army and uh, they would call on the radio and say, you know. So, uh, and then in 68, I was back again for another six months, and we were up off in North Vietnam, Tong Hoi, and we got shot up. Uh, we went into a bay too deep, and all of a sudden guns on all three sides opened up on us, and they had pre-spotted the guns on these stakes in the water. And so they were, we had, and I, I went down in my room, once I ordered all retreat, you know, I went down in my room and got my movie camera and I came up and I took movies and I had the gun splashes right next to the ship, 30 feet on either side, you know, and then one shell went off right above the ship and punched a hole in the ship. And I thought later, what would have happened if we'd been killed when I was down in my room getting my camera? People would have thought that I was a coward. And you're okay when they're shooting at you, but after you're out of range, which took about 20 minutes, if you're out of range and they can't reach you anymore, then your knees start to shake. You know? So so right before Ted, we were up off North Vietnam. And then when Ted happened, 68, we got dragged down to Hawaii. And we were doing all the gunfire support for the Marines at Hawaii. And, uh, and then in 72, I went back. There's an executive officer on the ship, the number two guy on the ship. And we were doing shore bombardment. By then, the gun maps are all pink because you, 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 you trace the target in a little red circle. And by 1972, it was the fifth time for the ship back on the coast, and all the maps were pink from erasing the. Linebacker, linebacker, yeah. That was on the last, in December. Linebacker 2. Yes. It was December of 72 and January of 73. And I would see. I couldn't see the b 52s but we had the noise. It was like thunder, just thunder coming off the coast. We would be like 10 miles off the coast and we had this thunder all the time from the B-52s. And then off Vietnam, South Vietnam, we'd have the MC-130 ships, the, the patrol, patrol, uh, propeller ships with a Gatling gun. And we would see them at nighttime, a solid red stream of tracers coming down to the ground. But we had some good, some funny times. One time, we were up the river in South Vietnam, and the, the rules were anything before 6 a.m. and after midnight, you could shoot. Didn't have to identify who it was. And we had, I hate to say this, but we had nuclear weapons on board. 
nowadays we can say that because it's, it's so old I can say that. We had nuclear death bombs for submarines on board and we're anchored up the ship with maybe two feet of water underneath us. And one night about 4.30 in the morning, these two little radar targets coming down the river and all I had was a sailor with a machine gun on the deck. And the gunnery officer said, Captain, request permission to shoot. You know, if they come in too close and they have explosives, we can't afford to be sunk right here. And the captain says, how many fishermen own wristwatches? How many fishermen have wristwatches? You know, do you want to go to your grave knowing that you blew up some fishermen? And we just held our teeth for about one hour. And the sun came up and they were innocent fishermen. And my captain saved their lives. Another time, we had the army call and said, target so-and-so. And I said, what's the target? It's a logistics asset. My captain said, ask him some more questions. I said, what kind of logistics asset? Well, it's an elephant. They want me to shoot an elephant. We said, we're not going to shoot an elephant. Sorry, buddies. <laughs> We fired so many rounds, 50,000 bullets, that the lining of the gun came out. And they said that had not happened since the Korean War. You know, when we went up to Japan for the shipyard, in the dry dock, we had the scratch marks underneath the ship from being right on the, on the river. Uh, another time, we'd be anchored up the river and all the little boats would come to us. They were the army guys saying, can we watch the movies? Can we get ice cream? Because every night <laughs> we watch a movie and they wanted to watch the movie too and get a, get a shower, you know. And so when we were up off North Vietnam, we called Sea Dragon Operations, Operation Sea Dragon. It's where the ships would go along the coast and shoot at the, the railroad trains and the tunnels and stuff. And that's when they shot back at us. My boss says, we have to attack two targets every 24 hours. It can be at midnight, dawn, I don't care. Mix it up, make it random. So when we would go in to the close, uh, close to the coast and shoot. But he said between 8 p.m. and 10 p.m., they, they said 2,200 and 2,200. I want to be far enough off the coast, no targets. I said, Captain, why do you want to Stop the war for two hours every night. He said, the, new, the movie's stupid, the movie. Nothing will stop my movie. So we stopped the war for two hours every night. So we watched the movies and have our popcorn. <laughs> you know why they decided to do that? My captain liked to see the movie every night. Oh. It was his decision when to attack. Oh. He said, I'm not going to attack between 8 p.m. and 10 p.m. And he, isn't he? And Tyler doing that or his superior no, I'm no, with that. No, they told us anytime you want, do it anytime you want, just <laughs> it was his authority to do that. So the the war was brutal and, yeah, and killed and so many American as as well as Vietnamese yeah. Americans. I had thirteen of my naval I graduated from the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. I had thirteen of my classmates killed in the war. And that's more than any other class, mm -hmm. friends of mine. We only had 900 graduates, mm -hmm. and they were all pilots in North Vietnam. And on my first ship, I was the communications officer, and my boss was the operations officer. He went in country to Vietnam. He was killed. They named the ship after him, the Morrison, on the Marcy. And my executive officer, the next man was Ot Sigmund, and he was in country Vietnam, and he was just standing talking to people, and a sniper got right in the head. So both my bosses were killed in Vietnam. They were not classmates, but they were very close friends. And so, uh, yeah, it emotionally affects you. <laughs> so what, do you what do you think about American policy toward the South Vietnam during the war? Well. It, you know, it, it was our job. And there's, I, I went to the Naval Academy under unusual reason. My father was killed in World War II by a German U-boat. He, My father was a captain of an oil tanker, the youngest captain on the East Coast at 27. 
and he was torpedoed in February of 1942 right off of Cape Canaveral. And, and he was the last one off the ship. He insisted on being the last one off the ship, but he'd been knocked against the, the wall and he was dizzy. So he misjudged and he fell between the lifeboat and the ship and got squashed. Mm -hmm. So that's, I was eight months old. And so I always wanted to be in the Navy and protect American merchant learning so they would not have that happen to anybody else. And so in my 32 years in a uniform, not one American merchant marine was killed. I did my job. The Maya quest came close with Cambodians, and we lost eight Marines, but I think eight, maybe more. But the American civilian crew of the ship was gotten back safe. So in my 32 years, I would do. So I wanted to be on destroyers to, to find submarines. They tried to get me to go submarines, to be a submariner in nuclear power, because I was very high in my class. And I said, no, my father was killed by a submarine. I'm going to go look for submarines, you know. And so I was always a, on a destroyer, a, a little, if you're going to be in the Navy, it's a great ship. It's 400 sailors, 300 sailors, 300 feet long. It's the greyhounds of the, of the sea. We're the ones that protect the aircraft carrier. We can do everything. We can shoot the guns at the beach, shore bombardment. We can find submarines. We can shoot down airplanes, you know, pick up pilots. Uh, many times in Vietnam, we were right off of Haiphong. We were just 50 miles off of Haiphong as a northern search and rescue station for a linebacker. Mm -hmm. And so the planes would come out, and if they could get to the water and parachute, that we controlled the helicopter. And we did that twice. And one time we found the wreckage of an A6 intruder. And that gave the clue that they were diving into the water. When they would approach the coast, they'd dive down low level. And their machine was not working right. They'd just fly in the water. And we were the ones that discovered that so they could fix the airplane. But we would also then protect the, the aircraft carrier. And so I was there right in between all the fishing boats right off of High Fountain. So, so the Navy was my profession. But the funny thing was we had a lot of sailors in the Navy who were there because they did not want to get drafted in the Army. So when they were about to get drafted in the Army, they run and join the Navy. So I would be over the table with the bat controlling the gun. And on the other side of the table would be my sailor plotting for the computer. And he would say, sir, we should not be doing this. We should not be in Vietnam. I say, yeah, you're probably right. Fire two, boom. And he said, yeah, but I don't believe in this war. Okay, fire three, boom. <laughs> we have all these debates with these college graduates who were sailors, smoking marijuana on the beach, you know, and, and we'd still shoot the gun. <laughs> you know, it's so, strange. So you know why we lost the war? Uh, the, uh, I, I go back on the common reason. Uh, we had Dean Russ come to my graduate school, and he said the whole reason for the gradualism and keep creeping and, and micromanaging of the war was we were afraid China would come in, just like they came into Korea. If we got too close to Hanoi, we would trigger China to come in, and then we'd be fighting China. And so that's why we had to just hold back the military and just bomb a little bit by the DMZ and then a little bit more and then a little bit more and stay away from Hanoi and Haiphong. And they were so afraid of China. Then after Nixon went to China, he felt secure enough that he unleashed linebacker one and linebacker two and they, they bombed Hanoi, they bombed Haiphong, they mined the Haiphong Harbor and then the Vietnamese came right to the table. If we had done that in 1966, we would have won. But we were afraid of China. So the military, you know, never lost a battle in Vietnam. You know, but the political will was not there. And, and that's what Dean Russ, he was the, the Secretary of State, he said, we're, we don't want China to feel threatened. I heard about the line of battle operation after the north and the south of Vietnam joined yeah. together and I have some cousins in Bowen and they said that if you like bomb one more day 
they could have defeated. They already yeah. written the defeat speech. Yeah, it was all just tied to the the peace negotiation of Paris, and it was just too tied politically. You know, if if, if in 1975, see Kissinger promised South Vietnam, sign this paper, and if you're ever invaded, we will come back and help you. Okay, so in 75, there's a massive conventional invasion by North Vietnam with tanks and jeeps, okay? It was not guerrilla warfare. They didn't have any Viet Cong left anymore. These were North Vietnamese regular army. They even had some men in the tanks chained to the tank to make sure they would not desert the tank. And so when they came down in 75, under the but Congress, in the meantime, had passed the law that said no more support. And President Ford's hands were tied. So we failed in our promise. And I was there when, when the, the two leaders came out of South Vietnam, the, the Air Force guy. Okay, when got yeah, yeah, and then the, the, the two, the, the general that was the president, too. Right? We went too. Yeah, and when they came through Guam, I was there. They, they were talked to by the press, and then we got them right through. They didn't stay. They stayed maybe one day, and they went to the mainland. But uh, it's so obvious. And so here I am in the military. We put so much of my life into it, and we, we lost because of the politicians in the mainland. And meanwhile, everybody's being nasty on the streets. And when I went to graduate school from 1968 to 1972, I was at graduate school, two master's degrees and a PhD. And I had to step over demonstrators to get to my class. And when I was defending my dissertation for my PhD, they had a bomb threat to the dean's office, not because of the invasion of uh, Cambodia, not because of me. But we had to leave the building and go down and finish the examination at the dean's house with a glass of sherry. <laughs> But I was always friendly with everybody, you know. I, I could talk to the SDS, the Students for Democratic Society, and they'd be out there on the, on the grass with old crosses for all the ROTC people that would be dying in Vietnam. And, and I'd go and talk to them, you know. And uh, the, uh, because we were right there at Harvard, you know. And uh, it was a whole different world. Uh, the the uh, uh, And now, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan, I, I was always against the Iraq thing before we went in. It was a clear thing because George Bush says, well, they tried to kill my daddy. That's why he went in there. When 9-11 when the happened, he came out of the office and says, you know, was Iraq behind it? Was Iraq behind it? Find me proof that Iraq was behind 9-11. Because he wanted to invade Iraq and take care of Saddam. There were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And, and even if they did have a nuclear bomb in Iraq, look at North Korea, nuclear bombs, we're not doing anything. Pakistan, nuclear bombs, we're not doing anything. India, nuclear bombs, we're not doing anything. Israel, nuclear bombs, we're not doing anything. The Iran's gone again, we're not going to do anything. We didn't have to invade Iraq. You know? So, and by then, I was a Navy captain in charge of policy at this at the four-star staff in the Hawaii. And I'm the one that made sure that the historic sites were protected. The archaeological sites, the cradle of civilization, you know. But anyway, it's a long story. But, uh, so we had our hopes up at linebacker, and that all came from Guam. That's what brought the, the POWs home. And here John McCain, it's being nasty to Guam and not, he's playing games on this realignment of military forces to Guam, which we need for our economy. And if it wasn't for Guam, he would still be a prisoner in Vietnam. It was a linebacker that brought the prisoners home. So you were very much involved and in, uh, what would you tell the young Vietnamese American about the war? how you feel about it in the brief 
know, well, the, they, they should, one thing is to be very proud of being Vietnamese. You know, Vietnamese is a ancient culture, and it's connected to Guam, you know, because the, the Chamorro people were kicked off the mainland by the Vietnamese kicked off the Malaysians and then the Malaysians and Indonesia. That's how they came. Our word for road here is the same as the word for road in Malaysia. Uh, Malaysian is a uh, challenge, but but the Vietnamese culture is, is so significant. If I was a young Vietnamese American, I'd say number one, save your language. If you can speak the language, pass it on. You know, otherwise, how would your children be able to speak to their grandparents when they get to heaven? I taught history of Guam, and I say that to the Chamorro students, and I said, if your mother spoke Chamorro. And you don't speak tomorrow. How will you talk to your ancestors when you get to heaven? And I've had them in tears. You know, a mother who would not pass on the language is a terrible mother. Okay, so that they should have pride in their culture, pride in their language, pride in their food. Yeah, and that sense of family. So you got to be proud. And they fought. And, and the communists can't say it was a pure civil war. The Ho Chi Minh was not a, a, a normal liberation type guy. I mean, they were chaining the guys to the tanks. That, that doesn't tell me much about motivation. And, and they just had the, 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 uh, the, 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 the uh, discipline, the control uh, to keep those people, you know, <laughs> yeah, bringing down the stuff down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. You have a 81 millimeter mortar you walk down the trail for three weeks and then put it there and you walk all the way back. You know, and they just kept coming, just kept coming. So, but South Vietnam, the military did magnificent. No South Vietnam military could have held their own against that, that major invasion in 1975. So they should be proud. They held out longer than anybody. Now, uh, many people, the fascinating thing, because I'm a political scientist, many people say that we really won. Think of this. The whole big picture in the world was to contain Russia until it imploded. That was the, the containment theory. Contain communism until it imploded. Right? And so these little wars Korea, Vietnam, they gave time. They were delaying tactics. It might be a battle, but the Cold War was the real war. And so Vietnam was just a delaying tactic to give time for Hong Kong and Malaysia and Indonesia to get on their feet. And so they could resist the advance of communism and time for the Russian system to collapse. And so we won the strategic picture in Vietnam by holding out for 20 years, 20, 54, 21, 21 years. And so uh, some people say it's an anti-colonialism war, a war of liberation, you know, it had all those elements in there. But, but the South Vietnamese military, they fought hard, but it gave time for Soviet Union to collapse. So I, if I would talk to a young Vietnamese American, yeah, you were, the, you, you were sacrificed. But in the large world picture, I, I, I grew up worrying about the communists. We had drills in school. When I was in school, we dive under the desk, drop in case of an atomic bomb. You know, we were taught how to dive under the desk. Uh, uh, and, and I had a, uh, my mother had a, uh, bomb shelter, fallout shelter they call it, in the basement. We had canned food stacked up and everything because we were worried that the Russians would, would win. They had the discipline and the, the try. And so, you know, I, I might have lost Vietnam and tied in Korea, but I sure won the Cold War and that's the one that counted. And now look at Vietnam now. Everybody's going back to visit, you know? so. And, and the people of Vietnam, I think, realize now they're, they're not a, a, a demand economy anymore. They're, they're, they have to diversify. 
they have to give some benefits to their people. So, so it's um, we have a lot of people in Guam. They go back, you know. I, I don't want to go back. I, I couldn't handle it emotionally. But uh, Bob Gates, he goes back. He's married to a Vietnamese lady, and he goes back all the time. And other veterans, they have veterans tours down to the tunnels and everything. So, so it, it's all coming out in the long run. But imagine how many people died. Yes. But many people still, <coughs> and I, I myself do think that uh, co Vietnamese communists, they uh, all look out for themselves, uh, they they are for their own, and then their party, because all the poor people still, if they're not yeah. communist party, you know, they, not, nobody take care of them. They're not part of it, no. The no. prosperity, not for the That's right. majority of the Vietnamese people, but the general. Yeah. Their own the uh, I still have because of <clears throat> my policy clearances in the Navy mm -hmm. when I worked in Hawaii and the Pentagon and the White House. I still, if I go to a communist country, if I go to China, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, I, I need not permission but notify. I, I have to notify our intelligence people, mm -hmm. and then I have to let them know when I come back out safe. I see. You know, mm -hmm. I have to have my wife drive, you know, so they can't pretend to have an accident with me and lock me up for, for driving in, a, in an accident, you know. Mm -hmm. So I went to the Olympics in, in Beijing and I had to tell the Navy intelligence I'm going. And sure enough, when I was there at the airport, this one man was just taking pictures of me. And I, we had an escort. My, my grandson's an Olympic athlete and this one escort was taking us on a tour and he said oh you were stationed on a berkeley class destroyer once so they really follow they knew you. my background they yeah. followed me and so <laughs> oh so i told that to the navy when i came back out and i said they're still keeping track of me and i retired 20 years ago so so i don't have many secrets left you know <laughs> i forget too much but yeah so that's communist so the Chinese, the North Koreans, the Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Cuba, they're still screwed up, you know. Look what's going on today in China with that dissident. So, so it was a good fight. It was a proper fight. Uh, we could have done a better job differentiating between anti-colonialism and self-determination and, uh, and the communist side of it. But, uh, but once you go into a war, you should decide to win it. Now, once Nixon went to China, it was obvious that China was not going to get. Matter of fact, after 1975, the next fight down there was between Vietnam and China exactly. on the border. Mm -hmm. And if, if Nixon had only known that, <laughs> you know, he could have done linebacker in 1960 better, better early, 68, you know. Oh, 72. 72, yeah, when he took over. And, uh, on um, before 72, when did he come in office? 68? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was elected in 68, so he should have done it in 69. But uh, they were just so afraid China would come in. And, and, uh, so intelligent world, not that great for memory. No, no, no. It was such a closed society until Kissinger went to China. Now, I'll tell you one difference. I was asked to go down to the White House to interview to be Kissinger's assistant to schedule her and go with him and take notes. And when I was in graduate school, I just finished my PhD. And I went down to the White House and I learned more in my three hours in the White House than I did in one year at graduate school. Alexander Haig was the deputy to Kissinger. And he was a one-star general. Later, he was a four-star general in St. Teresa's team. I was in the little room and it was smaller than this. It was just a little... So Kissinger came in and I had a stand to have Kitchener get between me and the desk. And he said, hey, you know, I want you to call House up and you tell that guy, that's Joe House up, the, the reporter, if he publishes that photograph of me at the Beijing airport, I'm going to, you know, never talk to him again. But he used a lot of profanity. And you got that? Exactly those words, right? And General Haig said, yes, sir. And Kitchener glared at me and he stomped out. A little later, the phone rang and Haig picked up, hey, Joe, 
my boss would really count as a favor if you don't publish that photo. Oh, thank you very much. We owe you one. And he gave me a wink. He said, my job is to pick people up off the floor when Kid Street kicks them out of the office and pat them on the back and keep them from quitting. And then the phone rang and it was Pakistan saying, we just had an Indian officer come in our embassy in Pakistan. Oh, he's a Pakistani officer asking for asylum and protect him because he wanted to go over to India. And, and the State Department said, what do we do? And Higgs says, this is America. We're not going to turn anybody over when we think he's going to get killed. If he has to live there for 15 years, the way Cardinal Ranzetti lived in our embassy 15 years in Budapest, you know, her, her lived 15 years in our embassy in, in Pakistan. And the heck with the relations, you know. If they don't, don't like it, tough luck. This is America. I was really impressed. Yes. And look what we ju just did now with this guy in Beijing. Six days and we push him out. You know, we should let him live there for 15 years. We did it before. And if China doesn't like it, tough. You know? So that's what I learned in that little visit. And then Kissinger said he wanted me, but only if I left the Navy. Because he was criticized for too many military people on his staff. I said, sorry. Forget it. So you refused that? Yeah, I refused it. So I'd like to ask you this so if you can share with me because I read a lot and I do a lot of research and interview people. Some people say that uh, Henry Kissinger went to China and traced South Vietnam for the uh, relationship with China. It was true? No, he wanted the relationship with China. Yeah. And that was the primary. But one reason why he wanted that relationship with China was to be able to make peace in, in Vietnam, mm -hmm. to, to freeze China so that China would not invade North Vietnam to fight us. So he could bomb Hanoi. So it wasn't, it was to save South Vietnam. He wanted to open up China because it was time to open up China. It was silly to pretend the country didn't exist. But the whole fear until then was that if we bombed Hanoi, China would stay. China would come in and fight the Americans and you know, in South Vietnam. So Kissinger wanted to make sure that China realized they had better future with us instead of fighting us in, in Indochina. Now we knew that Russia was crossing China to provide all the weapons for North Vietnam, all those missiles. And there was rumors that some of the pilots were Russian pilots, but all the airplanes were from Russia, not China. But is that contradict with um, some of the unclassified document lately um, they talk about Henry Kissinger was playing golf and when he heard about analog battle, you know, South Vietnam still tried to fight the battle. And uh, his comment was, why the South Vietnam means why don't they go ahead and die why don't last that long? No, 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 no. Huh? no he, his hands were tied by the Congress. In other words, Kissinger wanted to get the POWs home all through that war. When I was at graduate school from 68 to 72, you know, it's like I never left the war. When I went back, it was the same targets. The fear was, how are we going to get the POWs home? Because North Vietnam says, we're not going to release the prisoners until you leave South Vietnam. We said, we're not going to leave South Vietnam until you release the prisoners. So how are you going to get the prisoners home, the, the pilots? And so Kissinger wanted to end the war with a viable South Vietnam. Just like Korea, he saw this as a parallel with Korea, so we'd end up with a tie. We would just stop, stop them, so that we had a, a, a country of South Vietnam. You know, we, we know we're not going to conquer North Vietnam. So, so he he firmly believed that he negotiated that. He got the peace, the Nobel Peace Prize, and then Congress was so bitter that they passed a law that said no more no more support so it's congress the american public just did not want to continue anything now if, if, if congress had not done that and they thought they'd get away with it i bet nixon would have gone back and bombed them in 75 but the american public pressured congress to, to pass that law so it's not kiss here it's the american public now when I got home in 73, and then I got ordered to Guam in 74, so I really did not get back to the mainland until I went to the White House in 75. 
there's never any welcome home. There's no parade. That's what I heard. Yeah. People and sleep you know what? on the vacancy. Yeah, and then I went to Chicago as the captain of all the Navy schools. I had 10,000 students, 1985 to 87. All the Navy technical schools. I had 9,000 male students and 1,000 female students. And in 1985, Chicago gave us a welcome home parade for Vietnam. Finally. Ten years later. They just had one in North Carolina. Charlotte, North First Carolina time. just had a parade for Vietnam. First time. First time. When, when I was there in Chicago, I ended up on the platform with the mayor of Chicago, and I was a senior military active duty, Navy captain. You know. And here comes a parade, and right in the beginning it was General Westmoreland with a Vietnamese vet with no legs on the wall platform with roll, you know, roller wheels, he's pushing it down like this. And then came the big red one, which I had supported with my guns. And then came the 3rd Marine Division, which I had supported. And then the 1st Air Cab. And then the 1st Marine Division. And then the Navy guys. And they're, they're like me, you know. They're trying to get into their Navy, the old Navy uniforms, you know. And they're all... and. The cops were handing beers out to the people. The cops were handing beers out to the sailors, and the, the veterans. And I just was crying so much, I just climbed over the railing. I said bye to the mayor, and I joined the Navy guys. And we went down to Grand Park, where Obama gave his victory speech. And they asked me to make a wreath presentation at the, at the traveling wall. There's a little miniature Vietnam Wall, and they asked me to make the presentation. So then I invited him over to the Yacht Club, which is right on the edge where they join the water. And, <laughs> that's right. and so I invited some guys to come with me to the Yacht Club, because as a Navy captain of the schools, I was an honorary member of the Yacht Club. This is the famous Yacht Club, you know. And so in there, you cannot use cash. You just sign a chit, and they bill you once a month for what you signed for. Dinner at the bar and everything. So I had about five sailors with me up at the bar having a beer. And my driver, I had a Navy driver, and she came to me and said, Captain, we need to get back to the base. And I said, okay, keep drinking for me, you know. And the bartender put it on my tab. And I left, and she's driving me back to North Chicago, which is 40 miles. And halfway back, she says, oh, Captain, guess what? You have 10,000 veterans in the park right across the street from an open tab at the ritziest yacht club in the world. Do you realize, you know, what you just opened yourself up for? Those guys could have gone across the street, hey, come on, free drinks, you know? And it, I only, it was only like $150 when it came in, so I really, I came close <laughs> to being wiped out because there would be no limit, you know? The Chicago Yacht Club. It's like millionaires place, yeah. <laughs> so but that was nineteen eighty five, Chicago gave us a welcome home parade and I was in tears. So you think that the veteran Vietnam veteran was not treated awkward? Oh no. Even today. Compared to the Persian golf guys, you know, they got they got it made. No, but that's because the public, I think, learned a lesson on Vietnam. And so we, we, we did something right, you know. Because of our bad experience, they're treating the Persian Gulf guys nicely. And they were able to separate the politics from the soldier, you know. So they're not going to blame the soldier for the politics. Where in 1975, they blame the soldiers for the politics. Well, what else do you want to share with me? No, I just say that. I cannot watch, you know, the movie Apocalypse Now and stuff. I cannot watch that movie. Yeah, I, I know my limits. Just like I cannot watch Titanic because my father. Because all the emotional yeah, you get from yeah. the world. Yeah, maybe it's post-traumatic stress. I don't know. But, uh, you know, I, my, my two little Vietnamese girls, you know, they just have had major psychological problems where they go into a catatonic state, shaking, and, and uh, they're... they're evening out now under medication but the, I mean the, the, the impact of a war whether you win or lose it is forever I'm still 
reaction to my father being killed in World War II. It's, it's impacted my entire life. You know? and, and Vietnam, my kids, you know, they still have their Vietnamese dollar bills with the money, the paper money. They still remember it. But the people of Guam were magnificent. The people in California and Florida and Pennsylvania, they gave the federal government fits, you know. We don't want them here, we don't want them here, you know. And then the president had to really twist the arms to get an Indian town gap opened up and everything. And and people go on. The only thing they, the, the old initial, where they had right to worry that we'd strip all the food off the shelves. But that's the only little hesitation. Once we show them that we're gonna take care of that, you know, and, and that, that parade in 1975, 6,000 Vietnamese refugees being hosted by all the tomorrows. Well, I think that's you all. Be choked right now. For the information, I think out of Vietnamese American, we really appreciate uh, yeah. you know, warm, warm. Um, One person you should, two people you should interview. One is Senator Webb. He's married to a Vietnamese. Yes. And I think he speaks Vietnamese. And the other one is Richard Armitage. You ever hear that name? I think so. He in Re Washington D.C. Yeah, he was in the Republican administration. Yeah. He was Assistant Secretary of State. Yes. Big shot. Assistant Secretary of Defense. Yes. Richard Armitage. A R M I T A G E. So, I think uh, uh, Navy. Uh, yeah, he was Navy SEAL. Yeah. He was friends of Mike Dodge, and, and he was here after the fall of Saigon. He went back in found his compatriots and snuck them out again. Yeah. I think Navy just made a movie called The Lucky Few and they interviewed him there. Okay. Yeah. You know um, um, Mr. Paul Jacob? No. He, he was the head of New Light Operation on the ocean. Uh -huh. He was she, I mean he was uh, command to Vietnam a concern to uh, recoup or recoup all of the uh, Vietnamese ship would hand yeah. to, from America and he found out, although he found those ship but full with refugees. He's he the one who oh. said um, with, I think that uh, a historian, um, Navy historian, okay. uh, medicine um, Navy historian, his name is Jan, Jan oh. Herman. Okay, there's a uh, Buell, B-U-E-L-L, -L, who was the official, is that his name? There was an official Navy historian for Vietnam. He's a friend of mine. Can't remember his name now, but you could easily find that out. But uh, I picked up some Vietnamese refugees in 1984. Mm -hmm. I was on the ship out of Japan, oh. and they were in a boat in the South China Sea, and wow. we picked them up. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing about Guam, you know, nowadays everybody gets a medal for everything, mm -hmm. and the Admiral Staff never got a medal for that operation. Mm -hmm. Big injustice. No, yes, that's why the movie just came in my organization and two order just organized a big event for them on the last April twenty oh. first to honor them. I, I got a humanitarian service medal no. for picking up the Vietnamese in 1984. That's nice. But in 1975. That staff was magnificent, mm -hmm. you know? And the hospital, the Navy hospital has a mm -hmm. meritorious unit accommodation, all that stuff, but the Admiral staff never did. And I think the Navy, U.S. Navy saved 10,000 of life. And, oh, yeah. And I mean, they were just all the, they just came away from the coast. Mm -hmm. And we had every ship we could find there to pick them up. Mm -hmm. But, but they were, when they got to Guam, they were exhausted, in shock. Uh, they run out of diapers. The babies are all messed up with diaper rash. You know, so the first thing, like my, my ex-wife did, she had to build the police in there was Kotex, diapers, just, you know, and gave it to every female that came off that ship. You know, uh, baby lotion. You know, imagine coming all that way with no, no Modes, no Kotex, no, no. Diapers. For a few days, yes. Yeah. I mean, there's one lady that 
lady. Yeah. She changed herself to a mast on one of those ships because she didn't want to be thrown overboard. Imagine the emotional fear of being thrown overboard because they were running out of food. And she didn't want the men to pick her up and toss her over the side. So she chained herself to the mast. Heartbreaking. But this is what I'm proud of for. Thank you so much, sir. Setting education for 50,000 people within three days. With, and I asked the admiral, well, how many people do I have? Find them yourself. How much money do I have? None. When do you want it? Yesterday? <laughs> That's what he said.